Hello everybody. Today I am responding to Bart K's video about me. <laughs> I had made a 10 minute video about different diets being optimal for different phases of life and he spent an hour responding to it, uh, offering nothing of value or substance, no substance. Uh, but instead he just called me names, insulted me, called me an imbecile, a buffoon, and so on. Um, I don't really know how to respond to him because he didn't negate anything that I said. Now, this is my response to him, and this video is also going to be my critique of the carnivore diet. I had emailed Bart and asked him to have a friendly dialogue and debate about this topic, and that perhaps both of us could learn something. Uh, he responded with telling me that I must provide three peer-reviewed papers in order to uh, support my stance, or what he called moot, my point, my moot point. And I told him that my stance, that the carnivore diet is not optimal, is not based on peer-reviewed papers, but on reason, intelligence, and the bodies of work of several nutritional luminaries. And he responded with cussing me out and uh, flat out uh, refusing the online debate. Here are the emails. You guys can read the emails for yourself. So in this video, I am going to just simply critique the carnivore diet. Uh, as for Bart himself, um, the man is very obviously not well, okay? Um, and there's not much more to say about that. Now, I am going to critique the carnivore diet in about four different ways. First off, I'm going to use the bodies of work or the body of work of Weston A. Price, who was really a nutritional luminary, perhaps one of the greatest in the world ever. And his work done on indigenous tribes and studying their diets and how they're immune to dental decay, physical degeneration, etc. And I'm going to support his work with my own research and findings and prove basically that there has never been an indigenous culture that subsisted on a 100% cooked carnivore diet. So the modern carnivores, you are the first people in the history of the world to pursue such diets. Okay, your guys are an experiment. And there were plenty of high carbohydrate indigenous cultures, actually the majority of indigenous cultures who had very high prevalences of centenarianism or elders living past 100, did consume lots of carbohydrates in addition to nose to tail animal consumption. There was never a vegan tribe nor a cooked carnivore tribe, and I'm going to prove that in the first section here. In the, uh, in the second section, I'm going to get into the consequences of cooked meat and how it'll damage your glands, dry them up, and physically degenerate you eventually, okay? And then in the, and I'm going to do that using Ajinus von der Planet's work on cooked meat, as well as Dr. Francis Pottinger's work on cooked meat, and his experiments on cats, which are so important. People have to know about this stuff. Um, part three will be about a man named Walter Kempner, who basically in the 30s and 40s put people on a very high sugar diet, no fat or protein, it was just white rice, table sugar, and fruit juice. And uh, he worked with obese patients who were facing renal failure, and all of them lost dramatic amounts of weight, just like people do on the carnivore diet, put their dis various diseases into remission, cardiovascular disease, renal failure, et cetera, et cetera, psoriasis, you name it. And I'm gonna show how it's not the carnivore diet, it's not because you're eating meat now that your autoimmune symptoms are going into remission, it's because you're going on an elimination diet. Well, others have gone on elimination diets only doing sugar, and they also lost weight rapidly, and I'll show the pictures and all of this at the end. And in summation, I'm going to basically wrap up that the carnivore diet is not an ideal diet. It's great for therapeutic purposes. More, many people are metabolically disordered. They have leaky gut and autoimmune symptoms, and so it's great for them. But for the mountain top, if you want optimal health, you're gonna to have to eat raw food, and I'm gonna prove that here. The most universal disease in the world is the decay of the teeth. And unfortunately, we have not known the cause until we've gone to the primitive people to find how they prevent tooth decay. Our difficulty is that we are adding too much white flour and sugar and do not get enough of the foods that carry the minerals and vitamins. When the primitive people adopt the food of modern civilization, their teeth decay just as ours do. Now, Weston A. Price traveled the world after the First World War and he studied the last remaining primitive and indigenous tribes. And he sought out to find out why they were immune to dental decay. How did they prevent dental caries? He was a dentist. And he found that 
every single indigenous culture was in fact immune to not only dental decay, but the types of physical degeneration and malformed development we find in the commercialized world, especially in the modern West, right? And his research is very interesting. The majority of the cultures he did find were eating lots of carbohydrates, but all of them were also eating uh, very cherished animal products, protein and fat. Some people like to isolate the Maasai and Inuit, which he researched and studied and brought to the forefront of nutrition. So like this carnivore ketogenic community, when they always reference the Maasai and the Inuit, it's because of Western A. Price. He is the one who brought these people to the modern world and introduced their lifestyle, really. And the problem is that those people, the Maasai and the Inuit, are on the fringes of that, of the zero carb or low carb uh, cultures. Not all of them were like that. And sure, the Maasai and the Inuit were healthy, but there's something to keep in mind here. There were no cooked carnivore diets. The Inuit ate their meat 100% raw, nose to tail. And from the raw blood and the organs, they would obtain the electrolytes necessary, the alkaline mineral reserves, which is needed for optimal health. And it was all raw. Uh, there's the Nanet, another indigenous tribe that eats nose to tail animals. Many of the indigenous tribes that eat raw food, nose to tail, meat, animals, live around the Arctic Circle where it's very cold in the far northern hemisphere, okay? When you come south of that, there's not really raw carnivore people, not even cooked carnivore people, okay? But raw versus cooked carnivore is a huge difference, and I'm going to explain that in this video. People may say, well, look at the Maasai. The Maasai, as well as other Nilotic tribes like the Samburu and the Hamar, Afar, they are all on a 60 to 70% raw milk diet, which is a carbohydrate food. It has lots of carbohydrates in the form of lactase. They drink some blood and they have some meat cooked and raw, a lot cooked actually, but the majority of their diet is actually a raw food diet coming from carbohydrates in the form of milk. And the raw milk is important when you're eating cooked meat because, and as I will get into later, there's toxic byproducts from cooking meat. You cauterize the minerals, the iron becomes a free radical and damages your organs if you eat too much of it. And this is all buffered with the raw minerals in milk, especially the calcium. I'll get into the science of this later. Aside from the Nilotics, the Maasai, and the Arctic indigenous people who ate raw carnivore, there were a lot of indigenous tribes that uh, ate raw meat and cooked meat but we're on upwards of 30 to 60, 70% of their macronutrient intake coming from carbohydrates in the form of plants, starches, and vegetation. Examples of all this in Western A. Price's book were all the Pacific Islander people who are very strong. In my opinion, if you're familiar with Western A. Price's work, which is amazing, perhaps the greatest contribution to nutrition ever done in the history of the world, uh, the strongest races, uh, from my perspective, and he also commented on it, about how they were the most, built the most splendid physiques they were so happy. These people were living on islands, but they were on high carbohydrate diets from yams, starches, tubers, carrots, etc., etc., types of bananas. Uh, but they'd also eat their protein and fat from pork products and fish and so on, hogs on the islands. And uh, you then have like the uh, lower gentle Swiss, the isolated Swiss people in Switzerland, who also developed very well, they're very strong. But these people were also on a high carb, high fat, moderate protein diet, which RK is so against because of the Randall cycle, but he doesn't really understand the Randall cycle properly because an individual like that doesn't understand life. And in order to understand nutrition, you actually have to understand life. That's a fact. I'm sorry. You have to have some philosophical training because nutrition is not an isolated topic or subject. But anyway, the lower Shento Swiss, the isolated Swiss, were living off of sourdough bread and butter, consuming that two, three times a day, and then every third or fourth day, they would uh, kill a cow, and everybody in the community would get beef. The special part of Western A. Price's work, his book, is his recording of the uh, extreme joy, friendliness, happiness, and the superb characters of all these indigenous people, which in contrast to uh, the, the egos of modern commercial people, such as Bart's, there's a severe contrast, and you understand that the food, the modern commercial food, has caused not only physical degeneration, but spiritual and psychological degeneration amongst the Western races. It's a fact. So, uh, aside from the Lower Shento Swiss, you also then have the uh, people who were in the outer Herbrides Islands 
in the, uh, in the Northwest um, uh, United Kingdom. And these people, again, were eating lots of fish, lots of cod liver oil. They were getting their fat-soluble vitamins and proteins from those animals. But a staple in their diet was also oatmeal. For God's sake, they were eating grains just like the indigenous Swiss. And they were also a very strong race of people, very happy, developed all their wisdom teeth, were immune to physical degeneration, lived long lives. Okay, so some indigenous tribes we have come across on my own research, and there's so many of them. Um, I'm going to just list several. The, all the indigenous Amazonians are on a high-carbohydrate diet, but they eat local vegetation, local starches, roots, tubers, and they hunt monkey and wild hogs in the forest. People, look at this guy. In this documentary, this man is 60 years old. He's climbing up this tree to retrieve a monkey, which he killed with a uh, blowpipe. And these people eat a lot of starches. They eat a lot of carbohydrates as well. Um, my point in all this is that the vegans are dogmatic and will push their narrative, as will the carnivores. But both are just opposite sides of the same coin, the diet cults and dogma. Okay? My favorite and the most interesting uh, are the indigenous people of the Caucasus mountain range. So Caucasians or Adiga, the Abkhaz. Uh, Chechens, Dagestanis, and so on. These people are now dominating the world's mixed martial arts, uh, if you're familiar with them, like uh, the Khabib guy in the UFC. Only to food and drink. And these people, of course, they're pristine mountains, the water, the air, all has a significant contribution, just the same way it does in Okinawa and in the mountains of Afghanistan, Pakistan, China. Uh, but they are an extremely high carbohydrate diet, are omnivorous like the majority of the others, eating lots of bread, lots of raw dairy in the form of kefir and many other dairy products. Their local vegetation, fruits, nuts, and, get, and at dinner, at dinners, they are almost always have wine. I have a documentary on these people on my YouTube channel. You can watch it. I mean, there's one guy celebrating his uh, 95th birthday, and then I think the day after, he's going to celebrate his mother's birthday, who's turning like 130. And centenarianism is very popular amongst them, and there's been a lot of research done on them. Uh, and again, they're omnivorous. So my stance, again, this is just the first part to debunk the whole carnivore myth. Uh, the vegans are going to tell you, look at our ancestors, they were vegans, and as are the carnivores. The fact of the matter is you're not going to find a cooked carnivore diet or a cooked carnivore indigenous tribe. It doesn't exist. Sure, there's people who ate cooked meat, but they supplemented with a lot of vegetation or raw dairy. Now I want to get into and and again just a side note here people like Bart uh, insist that we have no need for carbohydrates well why can we store carbohydrates as muscle glycogen if you're a healthy individual you can store up to 1500 2000 calories depending on how much muscle you have as glycogen why do we have the ability to store liver glycogen from carbohydrates why do all of our cells have the ability to burn glucose for fuel as well as fatty acids? Why do we have that ability? Why do we produce amylase enzyme in our saliva and through our pancreas, which is solely designed to digest starch? Why are we able to host bacterial cultures in our colon, which ferment raw plant fibers and synthesize fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals for our well-being? Why do we have these abilities, these physiological uh, abilities to assimilate nutrition from plant foods. Okay, I'm not saying go vegan here, but we obviously are suited for plant foods as well. Why are all these previously mentioned indigenous cultures on fairly high carbohydrate diets, but immune to dental decay and physical degeneration, metabolic disorder, the, the way that the carnivores of today or modern people with all the autoimmune disorders are not? The reason is, is because it's not the carbohydrates which causes the physical degeneration of modern people or Western populists. It was the degeneracy, the hedonism, the alcohol, the drugs, the Adderall you took through school. It was the high fructose corn syrup, which was fortified in every single package of processed food. 
It was the glyphosate sprayed on all of the grains. It was the fact that the grains were not prepared properly, fermented properly in a traditional manner. It was the antibiotics you were given. It was the, the junk food. For God's sake, there's the celebration of Halloween where every year kids go get pillow bags of candy and then eat that for weeks on end. It was all of the junk food, the candies, the chips, the crackers, etc., which caused you to become metabolically deranged. They damaged the organs, damaged the pancreas, and damaged the gut. And thus, you're now at a point in life where you cannot tolerate even a gram of sugar. But guess what? Healthy people in isolated and indigenous cultures can tolerate a lot of carbohydrates because they're real plant foods. So my point here being is that it wasn't carrots, potatoes, white rice, you know, yams, other types of starches and roots and tubers that caused your metabolic disorder. It was the decades of all the other stuff, the real, the, the pseudo carbohydrates, which are the staple of your diets, which caused this. Guy used to drink a ton of alcohol. Well, not a ton, a fair bit, but not a ton. A ton is a thousand kilograms, Greg. So you see how literal this guy is. And now let me go into the detrimental effects of cooked meat. And rather than use research papers, which you can find plenty out there, and a lot of them are bullshit, and I don't like to use them because you can use any research paper to prove anything, and then someone else can negate that with another research paper. So I'd rather just use the bodies of work, certain nutritional luminaries who put their life into and dedicated their life into their research and who are far more trustworthy than just some vague research lab somewhere that god knows who funded okay um uh, the negative effects of cooked meat why raw meat is better than cooked meat very basic question great question well when you cook anything you begin destroying you know depending upon the temperature you begin destroying nutrients uh that's in any food not just meat but we digest meat and handle meat the best in my experiments with humans, of course, and dogs and cats. Uh, when you cook anything about 100, above 105 degrees or meat above 105 degrees, you break down the enzymatic activity. Now, a lot of people think enzymes are alive. They are not alive, no more than viruses alive. Uh, they are uh, protein structures to help uh, tear down, build up, or reassemble um, nutrients. And it could, they can be used in many ways, but they are not alive. But those are altered and cauterized at the beginning about 105 degrees. For some nutrients, it's even lower. Like for natural phosphorus, the cauterization process begins at 98 degrees. And by the time it hits 110, phosphorus is completely altered. That is when they go to check and some, see if something's been properly, so-called properly pasteurized, they look to the phosphorus to identify whether the the temperature has reached uh, at least 141 degrees. Other factors like vitamins uh, will be destroyed at about 122 degrees, 126 absolutely altered and not able to be utilized properly. So all, and then the fats, they break down into lipid peroxides, the proteins break, break down into heterocyclic amines and any kind of carbohydrates will be broken down into acrylamides. And those are just three of the toxins that are formed from cooking foods. And you've got 32 that have been identified from cooking foods. So the higher the, the, the temperature, the greater the byproduct toxins that are formed. And the three that I just named are all uh, labeled as carcinogens. When you cook meat, you destroy majority of the vitamins and the minerals. You destroy the hormones. Oxygen is in every single raw food. You destroy the enzymes and bacteria. And this creates it or turns into a subpar food. And every single organism in nature requires a 100% raw food diet in order to live and thrive optimally. We look into the work of Dr. Francis Pottinger and his research on cats. And it's a lot of work, but I'm going to give a summary of it. He did research on 900 cats over a span of 10 years. And he basically divided the cats into, the cats into separate groups, gave them specific diets for multiple generations, and then observed the results thereof study a most interesting development emerged the cooked meat cats were unable to successfully reproduce after the third generation most were void of sexual interests and those that had attempted to mate could only produce stillborn litters on the other hand the raw meat animals continued to reproduce healthy offspring generation after generation the notion that specific nutritional factors in food may be destroyed by heat processing is obviously not far-fetched. In short, cats which were fed raw meat only, 
uh, reproduced homogeneously. All the litter looked exactly the same, developed homogeneously. All of them developed well, strong, robust, were very playful uh, in nature. Um, the male cats resembled virile qualities. The female cats resembled feminine qualities. And they succeeded uh, efficiently and successfully generation after generation without any diseases. In contrast, the cats which were fed 100% cooked meat uh, in the first generation developed allergies and uh, fatigue. In the second generation, they were not born homogeneously. They were born in different sizes, some short, some tall, and all of them failed to uh, develop optimal development. Okay, so they would have certain teeth not growing properly, uh, stunted bone development, uh, and all of them had allergies. All of them were extremely lethargic and fatigued and um, had many allergies and many sicknesses. Uh, the male cats resembled female cats. They were tired and lazy all the time. The female cats resembled male cats. They were basically scratchy and fighting a lot. and They were not playful. Uh, in the third generation of cooked food cats, all of them were born, born with uh, malform malformities, uh, types of physical um, re retardation. Uh, many were born blind and um, they were completely infertile. And they were basically bedridden. They couldn't really move at all. And he kept repeating these experiments and he concluded that there, there's nutrition in raw food that is needed to develop cats optimally. Now, people may say, well, we're not cats or lions. We don't need 100% raw meat. Okay, that's kind of horseshit. The ones who eat 100% meat diets are raw. And I showed those, the indigenous Binet and the indigenous Inuit or Eskimo and all the Arctic tribes in the far northern hemisphere are raw meat eaters. Okay, and then another interesting uh, addition to this is there's a plate, there's a channel called More Plates, More Dates, over a million subscribers. The man is basically a hormonal specialist, very cool channel. And he did his analysis of people on the carnivore diet and their blood work. These are several individuals who published their, pub, uh, published their blood work results publicly after being on the carnivore diet for some time. And he does his own analysis of them individually. And the common thread amongst all of them is an extreme decrease in androgenic hormones. And what that means, if you're familiar with my work, is that the glands are atrophying, the glands are drying up. For us young, strong, healthy people, when we go on this kind of a diet, we uh, notice and sense the negative consequences of it uh, quickly, within a year or two. If you're an old individual like Bart K., uh, and you can tell that the man is very sick. He's 50 years old, but look at him. Um, and he admits he's a self-designated, he acknowledges he's a hedonist and drinks many cups of coffee a day. So, for, And he sits on a video game chair and cusses at people. For people like that who just want to put their autoimmune symptoms into remission, of course it's a great diet. Just eat meat and drink coffee. But it is by no means the mountaintop. Us younger people or us, uh, us people who want to experience higher levels of health uh, we're not going to experience it on a cooked meat diet. That's just ridiculous. Come on. There's a lot of consequences to, to eating all of this cooked meat. Now, if the solution, as Bart K. insists, is just to eat cooked meat, just to eat cooked muscle meat, it's pretty uh, mind-blowing that the wise sages and masters of traditional Ayurvedic Indian medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, both which have a 5,000-year history, traditional Iranian medicine, which has about a 3,500-year history, Greek medicine, which has a 3,000-year history, that nobody could figure it out, just eat cooked meat and thrive. Really? But Bart K. figured it out? In all of these traditional systems, they understood that the body is composed of multiple elements. In Europe, it was understood as the humors. In India, it was uh, understood as different constitutions, like Vita Pata. In uh, China, it was uh, understood as different elements. And I'll just use the Chinese system because it's very relatable. Uh, fire, air, earth, water were composed of different elements in the body. And disease was thought of to be a result of uh, deficiency of certain nutrition or excessive toxicity from certain foods, which imbalanced the elements or humors or fluids in the body. So something like a cooked meat diet, where cooked meat is consumed excessively, imbalances the water element, dries it up because of excessive fire or heat or iron, okay, or cooked protein. 
And this causes the kidneys to dry up, the glands to dry up, and the bone marrow to dry up because you're imbalancing the humors, you're imbalancing the elements. So cooked meat has a lot of toxic byproducts. And you need to buffer those toxic byproducts with alkaline reserve minerals, which you will only find in raw dairy or in very healthy carbohydrates that are planted or grown in very rich soil. Okay, and this is why you find many indigenous cultures eating either raw dairy or a lot of carbohydrates. If you only eat cooked meat, it's going to screw you up. Now, uh, when Dr. Francis Pottinger dissected his cats to find out why they were degenerating from the cooked meat, he found that in contrast to the raw meat cats who had very strong, healthy glands, the cooked meat cats had, had very dried and atrophied glands. The thyroid, the adrenal gland, the gonads are all dried and atrophied. And the reason for this is, is because first off, you need nutrition from raw food to supply these glands with the nutrition needed for them to sustain function. But further, when you cook a food, like meat especially, uh, it cauterizes and dries up the minerals and, and the iron inside there turns into iron oxide, it turns into a metal. And when you consume this in excess and bring it into the body, it will dry out the glands, okay? It's gonna dry out the body. And this was not only his conclusion, it's Ajumus von der Planet's conclusion, and very important today when we look at the objective anecdotal evidence on YouTube of young healthy people trying out this carnivore diet. In the beginning, they seem to love it, but long term, they all fail and suffer. For example, a great example of this, and I appreciate all these people being so public about it because it's for the benefit of us all. Frank Tofano says it ruined his health after several years on the diet. And again, the reasoning was, was iron toxicity, iron overload. Okay? Uh, there was Paul Saladino. Paul Saladino admits he went into burnout because of this, and I'll explain more about that later, but look at this clip of Paul Saladino. Because I'm sure you may know some of my history. I think we have similar histories in uh, trying ketogenic, low-carb diets and yep. crashing and burning. <laughs> and, and so for a long time, when I wrote my book about the carnivore diet, I mean, Danny Roddy you know, your friend emailed me and said, when you come around to carbs, let me know. So shout out to Danny Roddy that I came around to carbs. Um, but in the beginning... Okay, then there was a famous channel, uh, or a good channel uh, called The Strong Sisters. And you can watch this clip of them, of them reporting. They went into, they went into blowout as well, lost their menstruation. And they had thousands of women report back to them that they were losing their menstruation on this carnivore diet. Look at this clip. Not talking about it is a was a disservice to my community, and I still kind of regret uh, holding that inside for a long time because we would get a ton of messages from women being like, "Hey, I lost my cycle. Um, yeah, what what can I do?" And like, we just we didn't know how to answer those questions because we didn't have our cycles, and it started to feel really weird, um, yeah. and it was uncomfortable. I'm sure you get those messages. Um, now, I want to say something about coffee. If you uh, observe the majority of these carnivore influencers, they all consume coffee. Coffee is a drug. I made a video about why coffee is a drug, uh, and I do it from the traditional Chinese medicine perspective. You can go watch that yourself, okay? But the reason why these carnivore, cooked carnivore cults need coffee is because they, again, have dried up glands. They cannot produce any energy. Thus, they need coffee to constantly whip their adrenal glands expel stem cells from their bone marrow and produce adrenaline and cortisol in order to have energy and mental function. A good diet would uh, allow you to not require or necessitate coffee. You would not need coffee on a raw food diet, which I am a huge advocate for, either a raw living food vegan diet or a raw primal diet, such as the one um, espoused by Ogenous Fonder Planets. Um, they need coffee for energy, but they also need coffee for their bowel movements. The way coffee causes bowel movements let me explain this. When someone shits themselves because they get really scared, they pump a lot of adrenaline and cortisol. And what the body does is that it diverts energy and resources to the muscles and brain so that it can fight or flee. And it uh, opens up the intestinal bowels so that the organism can release its shit and not expend energy trying to digest it. And instead, harness those energetic resources for fleeing. Well, the body cannot differentiate between a, a mental fear, uh, physical stress and fear, or a biochemical stress or fear, such as from the drug uh, coffee and the caffeine content. And when you consume this caffeine, it again uh, scares the body because it's a biochemical stressor. 
Uh, individuals produce a lot of adrenaline and cortisol. The body shits itself. It gets scared. And it says, what the hell is going on? Let me flee from whatever is poisoning me here. This is actually how these carnivores, who are so lethargic and fatigued, shitting themselves. This is how they get through life. It's on coffee. But if you're a young, young individual and you want to be healthy and strong, you don't want to be drinking coffee and subsisting on cooked meat. That's ridiculous. Um, the funny part here is, is that people like Bart and a lot of these carnivore influencers, they're not even digesting a lot of their fat because coffee, it, ca caffe caffeine or coffee, as well as caffeine from other sources such as tea, has a chemical inside of there. And here are two papers which you can uh, look into further yourself, but there are, is a chemical inside there which inhibits the body from being able to produce light paste, which is a fat digesting enzyme. So these people are not even digesting their fats. They're shitting it out because the coffee is scaring the shit out of them. Literally, it's scaring the shit out of them. Uh, and they can't even digest their fats. Okay, so they're not expending really any energy on digestion. These people are actually on a coffee diet, and maybe some protein that they're getting from their food. Now, let me go further, and let me talk about Walter Kempner. This man, in the earlier part of the 20th century, uh, put people on high sugar diets at Duke University. It was a diet that consisted of white rice, which I'm a huge, a huge advocate for, uh, table sugar, refined table sugar, and fruit juice, and a multivitamin. Nothing else, no oils, no fats, no protein, nothing. And the intention was to help renal failure. He had basically patients who were um, towards the tail end of renal failure. He experimented with them, put them on this diet, and all of them reversed their renal failure. The majority of them were obese and needed insulin, and they all ended up losing, on average, 140 pounds. Became very skinny. Here are some pictures. You can see pictures. One individual, this man lost 285 pounds. This woman lost 135 pounds. This woman lost 115 pounds. And not only did it work for diabetes and insulin resistance and obesity and metabolic disorder, but it also worked for things like cardiovascular disease, um, as well as psoriasis. And the reason why it worked was because just like the carnivore diet, it's an elimination diet that removes a, a critical macronutrient, which is needed to develop properly. And so if you remove like on the carnivore diet, everything, and you move carbs, you'll get skinny. But the opposite is also true. If you only do sugar and remove uh, all fats and proteins, you'll also dwindle and get skinny. And I think that actually going the high sugar route is preferable in most cases because uh, you're not expending energy on digesting the cooked steak. And all of the energy is instead harnessed for detoxing and repairing the body. It's a very interesting diet. Of course, today we also have glyphosate and uh, the high prevalence of antibiotic use amongst people. And so they may actually just need to do the carnivore diet and consume a lot of gelatinous animal fat soups in order to heal the gut. Uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century, leaky gut was not as big of an issue. Now again, these are my critiques of the cooked carnivore diet. And what I am an advocate for is a raw food diet. I am very, I am very enthusiastic about raw foods. Um, at a bare minimum, if people can do raw foods, I think the carnivore diet is great for therapeutic purposes, but long term it has issues. Uh, for long term, if you want to go and have an amazing life and have a lot of health and mental clarity and just feel amazing every single day, and a traditional diet doesn't work well for you, even after you have healed the gut, you want to go raw food, either raw primal, which is raw meat, raw eggs, raw butter, raw dairy, raw cream, raw honey, etc., or raw living food, which is a raw vegan diet, but it's different from like the fruitarianism and all that. You're basically growing your own sprouts. You harvest those sprouts on the spot, put them into a salad, put dressing on it, and eat it. And you get an amazing bioenergetic force from that. And the only people in the world teaching this stuff uh, are the people at the Hippocrates Health Institute. And the reason why I'm a big advocate of raw food is because I've tried these raw food diets, and they are by far superior to everything else. Uh, and you feel amazing on them. And the individuals who advocate these diets look and feel amazing and have amazing energy, Arjunis and Brian Clement. Now, in this clip, Bart says when someone advocates a certain diet, you should judge their appearance uh, when they advocate a diet. Well, look at Bart. He's a 50-year-old man, very gray, gray hair, Norwood 7, very gray skin, and a very horrible personality. Just cast a discerning eye over the looks of these characters and the way they present, the way they hold themselves, how they look. Because if your health is destitute, 
you can't hide that. It shows. Yeah. I mean, you look at some of these characters, if you don't eat your fruits and vegetables, you might die. Those kind of characters. <laughs> just have a look at these guys. For, for just, 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 just freeze frame it if you like, and just look at these, the videos these guys are presenting and, and, and tell me they look like the people that you would want to take health advice from. Look at Brian Clement, who is 20 years older than him, has not consumed meat in 50 years, but is on a raw food living diet. Let's look at Brian. And can you imagine the power that that seed has? And you are taking hundreds or thousands of those a day and drinking them or eating them in your food. We're now taking you into quantum biology, the way that legitimate nutritionists are moving. Not talking about protein, vitamins, minerals, interesting stuff, but old school. That's old school stuff. It's okay, the differences are astounding. Now again, uh, my point was always that the carnivore diet is therapeutic, but it, it is not optimal long term. And I hope I have made my point clear in this video. Okay. We do have a need for carbohydrates. Our physiology is not only adapted to it, but can thrive off of it. And when we, when we do not include carbohydrates for a very long time, people can crash. Excessive cooked meat has a lot of toxicity. Many indigenous cultures consume lots of carbohydrates or raw dairy to buffer the problems from cooked meat toxicity, such as the iron and cauterized minerals, which is buffered by the alkaline reserved minerals, such as calcium and magnesium in carbohydrates or healthy carbohydrates or raw dairy. Um, carnivores an elimination diet, just the same way Walter Kempner's high sugar diet was an elimination diet and they lost weight and put many diseases into remission. So Francis Pottinger studies where the cooked meat cats all had atrophied glands. Uh, people may say, well, I give my house cat cat chow and cooked meat, but keep in mind when you leave your house cat outside, it does go hunt uh, birds, mice, rodents, and lizards, and it has some raw food there. Um, and I think I've made a, a pretty good, clear argument here as to why I do not think the carnivore diet is optimal. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.